Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Aku Hawaii uh, Roundtable, Navigating the Next Normal, Handling the Trials and Opportunities in Today's Workplace. We are really fortunate today to be joined by Emily, Dick Emily Dickens, who currently serves as Corporate Secretary, Chief of Staff, and Head of Government Affairs for Society and Human Resource Management. I will take a moment to more formally introduce her uh, as we get started, but I wanted to start today by welcoming you and going over a few housekeeping items. My name is Kirsten Fox, and I serve as the Director of the Placement Exchange, which is a partnership with Aku Hawaii. So I also have the good fortune of being an Aku Hawaii staff member. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to introduce our speaker today, as well as moderate questions amongst each of you as participants. Uh, in today's roundtable. A few housekeeping items as we begin. You should be able to notice in your uh, control panel that there is a question and answer button on your Zoom menu. If you look for this, take a moment to look around and make sure that you can locate this Q&A. This will be the place that we really want to make sure that we are facilitating conversation as well as questions. There is also the chat feature, but the question and answer is a really great place for you to actually put your questions. Um, we will start with a presentation by Emily, but there will be time at the end to have questions from each of the uh, attendees today. So definitely we will make sure that we get, get those. In addition to the Q&A button that you are able to see, there is also an opportunity to raise your hand. So if you can look for the raise hand function and try to spend the next few seconds raising your hand. Excellent, oh, there they go. Yep, they've got up and now they're going back down. Perfect. So we can also uh, have the opportunity this way to call on uh, different attendees. And then finally, you can also feel free in the Q&A to kind of upvote or comment. Um, it doesn't always have to be a question. Definitely feel free to share your thoughts. If there is somebody else that shares their thoughts and you want to respond, uh, by all means, we encourage you to do that as well. We really want this to be as interactive as possible. We know that this is a topic that is on top of mind for all of us in these days uh, working within higher education. So we want to make this as beneficial to you as possible, um, as well as um, just giving you the opportunity to get some really great information. And so with that, I'd like to officially welcome Emily Dickens as today's speaker. Emily, as I mentioned, currently serves as Corporate Secretary, Chief of Staff, and Head of Government Affairs for the Society of Human Resource Management, also known as SHRM. She previously has served as a member of the leadership team at the University of North Carolina System, the Association of Governing Boards of Colleges and Universities, and the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. She's also worked at Duke University and Fayetteville State University in both administrative and external affairs roles. So she comes with a wealth of experience on our college campuses. Over the past few years, Emily has also become a good friend to Aku Hawaii, and we have been so fortunate to have her wisdom and insights at two of our State of the Profession Symposia, and of course, speaking with us this afternoon. Today, we'll be fortunate to be able to hear from Emily, who will be sharing her unique perspective on navigating the trials and opportunities that come with navigating the workplace's next normal, and specifically in this higher ed setting. In addition to her professional roles that I shared, Emily also brings a myriad of board service into this perspective. Just a small sampling includes her role as a member of Strategic Education, Inc. Higher Advisory Board, the Advisory Board of College of Arts and Sciences at uh, North Carolina Central University, and she also chairs the International HBCU Task Force for Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And again, this is only a small sampling of her board service. So she brings a wealth of knowledge to today. Um, and she's also very busy. So we're that much more gracious of her time uh, that she is able to share with us today. And so with that, um, Emily, I would like to turn it over to you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Holly, who is participating today for the call. Uh, I'm gonna jump right into it. So some of you uh, I've probably met before, uh, I was just thinking about February 
uh, where it was a pretty nice time in New Orleans, a good time to be there, where I introduced this slide to many of the participants. And it's something we call VUCA. Uh, and I told you all that we were living in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous time. And uh, I guess in, in two, three months, that time has even gotten more volatile. And I also talked to you about what I perceive that the key issues for higher ed in particular would be. So next slide. I talked to you about the fact that the era of achievement was gone and that we were seeing a lot of change and that many people thought that they could be out of jobs in 20 years on institutions of higher education campuses and that many of the programs, degree granting programs that were being offered today would be gone uh, in the next 30 years or so. Next slide. I also talked to you a little bit about digital transformation and how that was impacting your workplaces and about especially that so many CEOs admitted that they had not been able to keep up with the pace of digital transformation needs. And did we not see that when so many of our campuses had to become campuses that were remote. And then we also saw that more organizations were leveraging augmented and virtual reality learning methods. And we said that they would realize eight times more leadership bench strength than others. We know right now that they're more successful right now because they already began leveraging those particular resources. Next slide. I also talked to you a little bit about the evolution of education and that people were questioning financial sustainability and price, and that the um, public universities were experiencing more system-wide consolidations than we had seen in some time. And then there was more, next slide. And I'm just gonna mention one of these, bricks and mortar 2.0, that uh, for-profit entities were now venturing into the brick and mortar game, and they were building education centers, not dorms, and within miles of their online students, they were getting rid of their classrooms and that these centers were now providing academic counseling, financial aid and employment services for the online students. Then I provided you a bit of advice and some recommendations. I asked you to not let, uh, to not leave here believing, we'll leave there, believing that this wouldn't trickle down to your university. And I wanted you to begin thinking about how you and your in university prepared for the day when the average student had no interest in living on campus and or your university was going to merge and that housing would now be unnecessary. Next slide. Then I told you that you had to think differently about your organization and yourself and be doing it at all times constantly. So for those for you, of you who left that talk in February, thinking that you heard some things before and everything worked out and then we'd go back to business as usual. And for those of you who weren't there in New Orleans on that day where I told you to think differently all times, here's how things have become even more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous in the last few months. On the next slide, our Sherm research will tell you 71% of organizations say adjusting to remote work has been a challenge. You probably know this. 30% of organizations say their ability to pay their employees is a challenge. You know this as well. And one third of organizations are grappling with the changes in employee productivity. And the one I didn't know until this research came out, which was very sobering, US workers have lost $1.3 trillion in income during this pandemic. So that something is that resonates with you personally, professionally, and as you think of your customers, those students, those parents that were paying tuition. On the next slide, I was just sharing with the team that I was on a college campus in 2009. And I, my husband was uh, working in K-12. So we were both state employees and we were both thinking, what, what was so bad then? You know, what were the things we had to do? What were the changes we had to make then to deal what, what was going on with the economy. And it was still nothing like what we're seeing now. 38% of organizations have enacted furloughs or layoffs. 25 colleges and universities alone are now facing lawsuits of students who want their money back because they've not been able to get on campus. And then there are predictions that enrollments for the next academic year will drop by 15% 
including a 25% decline in the number of international students. On the next slide, I'll, I'll tell you, you know this, your business model is challenged. And there's the data, and we're sharing this with you, so I won't even read that data, but I'm sure you're seeing it as well. And as we go on the next slide, where we talk about there's even more, here are four things that I think you've got to think about. The big guys are in debt, everyone's not in wait and see mode, full paying customers are not returning, and fewer people want the free money. And what does that mean? That means that the campuses like GW, Northwestern, and the University of Arizona are seeing record shortfalls in the $90 million, $300 million range, right? That means that schools are already announcing that they're closing for the fall semester and they'll be operating remotely. Harvard Medical School is one of those. That means that community colleges are taking advantages and advantage of this opportunity and offering things like full tuition assistance for up to a year for students facing financial hardship because of the pandemic. And that means that there are schools that are just eliminating things that can't bring back, like athletics. We've got four schools that we know of, that I know of, that are eliminated football, indoor track and field, wrestling, and men's soccer. And when we talk about full paying customers not returning, we're talking about your international students those Chinese students who now have an inability to return to school, an inability to continue their education due to poor distance learning options, and the inability to engage in formal assessments of their learning. And that that reduced revenue from not just the students from Asia, but from other parts of the world has yet to be fully calculated, but it's estimated to be somewhere between five to $10 billion per semester. And finally, when we talk about fewer people wanting the free money, that means that we have fewer people who are completing the free application for federal student aid. Completions among high school seniors down 3.1% and renewals are down 5%. On the next slide, here's the one that is gonna get you. The, those who are thinking about the future, the big ones who are already thinking about how they can see opportunity out of this crisis are going to be going after your students if you're at a mid-size or a small university because now they can offer the brand, that big name school brand virtually. And they can now open their doors to students who would not have been admitted before. They're relaxing their admission standards for the first time. So on the next slide, I bring you back to those four things I discussed at the beginning volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, VUCA. And just like I said a couple of months ago, that we're experiencing now is, it's now more exigent. And for many, it's not something we could have ever imagined. But I promised Holly, I was not just gonna give you all the bad news. And I wanted to rush through all the bad news because I think that there is an opportunity for good news and one of those opportunities relates to one of the recommendations I left with this group back in February, that I believe that the critical area that will help you ensure the sustainability of your business is talent. And so on the next slide, I repeat for you something I shared when we were together in New Orleans. Talent is everything. Talent will have the single greatest impact on business and the economy today and tomorrow it is everything. People are the single largest resource and investment for any organization. And so I ask you, do you have the people who can transform the status quo within your organization, who can think outside the box, who have unique experiences that can help your organization think differently? Are these people taking into account that your organization does need to think differently? And due to furloughs, layoffs, and recruitment, what your workplaces look like, how and where people work, who's in the workplace is changing at more than the speed of light. Even in this pandemic environment, talent management doesn't stop. That means how you position yourself as talent and how you manage the talent you express, that you supervise. So I'll say that again, talent doesn't stop. And that means it doesn't stop how you position yourself as talent and how you manage the talent that you supervise. It's how well, it's really how we'll get through this crisis. And it's the key to how you'll recover, your organizations will recover, and how you'll thrive again. Now is the moment to lean into talent, even with 30% unemployment. Many of you will be asked to make decisions about letting go employees 
for temporary periods of time through a furlough or permanently. How you make that decision will be critical to the recovery and sustainability of your organization. So this is the right time to take inventory and assess the talent you manage. Recovery must begin before the crisis is over. Are you developing the right people? Are there gaps on your team? Do you have a strong leadership bench? Are you loaded down with people who are not culturally aligned? This is the time to lean more into your organization's values or fix what is not working in your culture and on your teams. How your people have been performing and adjusting during this crisis, good or bad, will allow you to appreciate the importance of culture and getting it right and making the necessary changes. As we come out of this downturn, we're going to need the best of the best to be part of the workplace revival. So where you have talent gaps, you must be on the constant lookout for filling that need. Use this time to revisit people who impressed you before but were not available and develop new relationships. Either could pay off with the new hires you will need to help your organization recover. And yes, there will be new hires. Right now, our nation's CHROs are planning for an abundant talent market post the COVID virus. Finally, what this landscape shows us and has taught us more than ever is that we need better people managers. You cannot rely on people who have to call HR every time there is a people issue. HR is very busy making sure your facilities are safe to return to, that workplace flexibility policies are aligning with the needs of employees in the business, and ensuring onboarding and exiting employees is done in the best manner possible. More importantly, they're advising your presidents and chancellors about how best to help his or her people. So for the benefit of the entire organization, you need people who can manage their employees and join you in your efforts to retain and recruit the best talent. You need to get serious about people managers and invest in the good ones, especially as you walk employees through the realities of the new workplace. Bad managers will put you behind in the race to recovery if the strong talent you bring in is driven away. People managers are the partners HR needs to be effective and cultivating strong culture and productive employees and engaged teams falls on you and your people managers. So how do you do it? Well, let's look at the next slide, which I think and I hope we'll spend the most time on the next two slides. Keep going. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So there are four key areas that need your focus as you assess the talent under your management. Retain, reskill, repurpose, recruit. How do you determine who to retain? Well, you ask the question about whether this person is aligned with your organization's culture. And I'll give you an example about how you do that. At Sherm, that would mean, is this person someone who works with a bold purpose, who does their work with excellence and accountability, who's smart and curious, flexible and agile, and open collaborator? Those are our guiding principles. So every manager must assess each employee with that lens, of those five things that we think about when we're thinking about our employees. And then you ask, what is your stickiness factor, right? Why would people who you want to retain want to stay? Money is not the only motivator. So those questions will help you identify who the people are that you want to retain and whether they want to be retained. The next two areas I'll put together, reskill and repurpose. You have employees that are a cultural fit, but the job they're in must go. Can you quickly and cost efficiently reskill them or can you retain them in the organization but repurpose them in a position that may not necessarily be in your shop? Because if this person is a cultural fit, keeping them in the organization to assist in the recovery is the most important goal. Recruit. I mentioned this earlier, but think critically about who you've met that has impressed you and connect or reconnect. Identify industries with similar skill sets that have let people go and ask your peers for recommendations. I keep thinking about how Amazon had so many jobs open, yet there were so many restaurants closing. And Amazon runs a line like a restaurant runs a line. 
so many of those people probably could have helped Amazon out in the early days because they knew how to keep a space very clean. They knew how to work very quickly and to keep the customer in mind. Think about peers from other organizations and other industries that could make a difference within your organization. Now on the next slide, I wanna talk about you. And the big question you have to ask yourself is, does your boss want to retain you? Have you made it easy for them to determine that you are essential no matter the role you play on the team? Whether you like it or not, you're in the marketing business when it comes to showcasing yourself as good talent. And so your four words are elevate, integrate, innovate, and motivate. When I say elevate, I say that marketing yourself is essential. Are you someone who's always trying to make things better? Do you invest in yourself professionally? Are you a learner? Do other people know what else you do? I'll use a personal example here. I've got oversight for five areas, executive office, administrative services, global outreach, government affairs, and board relations. So now to many people that may look like a hodgepodge of duties, and maybe it is, but my boss knew that A, I'd worked my way through law school as an EA for two VPs at Duke, so I pretty much can tell you how to run an executive office. He knew that one of those VPs I worked for was a university architect, so I can talk to you for days about signage, spacing, construction, maintenance, and that helps because as head of admin services, I've oversight for real estate valued at $60 million, and we have tenants as well. Government affairs is an easy one for everyone because they know my background and that I've been a director and a VP and worked for a mayor. And board relations, yep, I've got that covered too since I worked for the Association for Governing Boards. Now I don't go around wearing my resume or touting my resume to my colleagues every day and probably most of my colleagues on the E-team don't know about some of my experiences. But the person who should know does, as well as a few other well-placed people who I consider mentors and sponsors. Can you say the same? Do you have people who are well-placed that are the most, most important people who should know about all the skills you have? So when they need you to fill in, to stretch, to do something different, that they'll think of you. Integrate. How collaborative are you? Do you ask your peers about their work? Have you found ways to add value to their work for the good of the whole organization? Do you have people sitting in other parts of the organization that will vouch for you if your boss asks them about you or if he or she needs to repurpose you will there be allies waiting to help you more fully integrate in that new area innovate has your division grown professionally what have you done for the business lately that is new innovative cost-cutting customer-centric and money-making housing is a pnl what have you done that makes people think you can come up with ideals ideas that will assist with recovery and motivate. Here's the catch. You can have the first three things mastered, but if people don't want to work with or for you, it will be easy to let you go. Do people look at you and see something good? A leader, a mentor, passive or active, an example, a problem solver, a partner. I know this is a lot. And there are so many things I want to add to this, especially about you and your people. But I want to end here and open up the questions because I know this is an important time for all of us. And in any way that we can all help each other through this, I think it'll be really great. So thank you. Great, and thank you, Emily. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, giving us this information. And as you mentioned at the beginning, there was a little bit of gloom and doom of the future, but obviously there's still um, an element of what will come back and, and having the talent there, I think was really poignant. So at this time, we would like to open it up for questions and answers. Again, you can feel free to use the Q&A chat um, to ask some questions and then we can answer them. Uh, one question that we have received is as people are, you mentioned motivate at the end. There are some staff that have reached out privately, uh, probably not wanting to put themselves out there, that they had been in a place where they were thinking of job searching, but now given the current um, state of the profession, are staying in the jobs that they are in because they feel very lucky to have a job. Um, how do you encourage them to continue to feel motivated in a role that they were otherwise potentially planning on leaving? 
Oh my, <laughs> I don't, none of us want people who quit and stay, right? That's the, the worst type. And so I understand, uh, I think I may have shared this with you when, when I saw you all in, in New Orleans or maybe the time before then. I sat in a job uh, where the person who hired me had been terminated. And for just about a year, an interim person had no idea what external affairs people do and told me I couldn't meet with elected officials. And so literally I came to work every day and I really was not doing the thing I really wanted to do. But I came to work every day, I showed up and simultaneously I was on a job search. And so I think you can do both. I had enough relationships that I had developed and I was able to tell people privately, I thought very privately, but more the most part privately that I was uh, looking for work. Now I'll tell you my situation was really interesting when they hired the permanent, permanent chancellor. And on uh, his first day, he came in my office and said, I heard you're looking for a new job. <laughs> uh, so that was a little crazy, but it turned out he was really good friends with the chancellor of another school who had interviewed me. And he said to me, what can I do to make you stay? Right, because I never quit on the job. And so I continued to represent myself. I talk about marketing yourself. That's part of marketing yourself. You never know who's watching you. And I've gotten a couple of jobs that way by people who just saw me working and they knew I worked hard. So, you know, you can do both things at the same time. Make sure you're going to work and you're doing, you're giving 100%. If you can give 110, 150% because you're marketing yourself there. And then you simultaneously, there's still an open market. CHROs are looking for people. Still be marketing yourself externally for your next opportunity. Great. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions uh, referenced how great all of your suggestions were. Do you have specific suggestions though on how um, attendees could use your methods if they are not the ones who are talking with senior leadership about these decisions? Oh, so here's the thing is, here's an opportunity for you to make yourself look innovative, right? <laughs> you can share these slides, right? So, I remember going to events and getting the slides and coming back and scheduling time with my super, my direct supervisor and saying, look, I just came back from this event. Ah, speaker was okay, but these slides are really helpful, right? And um, as you're thinking about, you know, making changes, I know we're in a, a constant, we're in a state of constant flux that, you know, had you thought about thinking about this thing or that thing? And maybe you don't even tell them that you got the information from the slide so you could just look really like you're thinking differently about things. But I think you look for opportunities to have conversations just because you're not the final decision maker. You might have an opinion. Now it's how you come to them with the opinion. So you don't want to tell them you should do this, this, but really schedule that meeting or maybe during your one-on-ones and said, have you thought about this? Here's something I'm thinking about. Great, thank you. Uh, another question we received, the majority of our campus housing staffs are younger professionals due to the current climate and not even knowing um, how or when halls will reopen. Many of these are the staff who will need to be let go. How would you suggest talking with these young staff uh, about this situation and how do we coach them towards leveraging their essentialness? Wow, so I'll tell you, you've gotta be as transparent as you can. I, I don't. I'm not, a, I'm from New York, so I don't sugarcoat anything, right? I think you just got to tell them what the situation is, right? And then uh, we talk about this thing in Sherman, we call it red carpet in, red carpet out. How can you create a red carpet experience for them on the way out? Because 10 years from now, this may be somebody you want to recruit back for a directorship or something, right? So how will they always remember how you treat them? People remember how you make them feel. Uh, and I think there are some things you can do that are not as costly, right? You can connect them with some of your vendors who may not be letting people go and may need that subject matter expertise, even on a consultant basis, on a part-time basis, right? You can do that. You can also provide them outplacement services. There's a cost related, right? And, but most of them, if they're younger, they're not gonna have big severance packages anyway. And so what you can provide is two or three months of outplacement services, someone who could help and coach them through the period that they'll have to find another job. You can also still connect with them and have them and say if they're willing to continue to do side projects or to go in another, if they ask them if they have an interest in another area of the business, of the organization. If it's not housing, was there some, here's an area where we have lots of needs, right? It might be in administrative services because now you need people to think about how you keep spaces clean, 
how you communicate with people on how to keep those spaces clean and to keep the safe distances. It could be communications because having to deal with students and parents, you have to be a certain type of communicator. So find opportunities if you can within the organization, if you think it's somebody you want to retain. If it's not someone that you want to retain anyway, right? You think here's an opportunity to do them and maybe have that real conversation that says, maybe this isn't for you that I know you like working in this, but here's a time for you to look outside and see if there are other things that you can do and have and be more passionate about. I think that's so really be as transparent with people. People, I think the sooner you can tell people what is likely to happen, the sooner they can begin to prepare. I think that transparency is really important. Thank you, Emily. A follow-up question, uh, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, uh, the placement exchange, which is uh, co-presented by Aku Hawaii, typically takes place our big in-person event every spring. This year we had well over 400 graduating graduate students from master's programs that were in the job search process uh, in the, at the time when the pandemic really, really hit. The majority of those graduating grad students have not been able to find positions for obvious reasons. Do you have any advice for graduate supervisors, uh, mentors that are still within the higher education settings uh, to be able to pass down to them? Look outside higher ed, right? It's, no one says you can never come back. And sometimes you have to leave home and do something for people to look at you differently too. We always say that. So here's an opportunity to learn another business that can help you when you're on the other side. What else do you have an interest in, right? Are you somebody, what was your minor in? So I would say, you know, this industry is on, is, is, really going to be hit very hard. But what are the basic skill sets that you have that can be applied in another industry that will help you gain additional skill sets that then you can leverage when and if you get back in higher ed? Great, thank you. And I know there's probably some of those graduate students on the call today. So I think reiterating that message is important. Um, an anonymous attendee asked the question, some of our live-in staff are 10-month employees who are now finding themselves being furloughed. What some suggestions do you have for those particular staff? Wow, I know, so, wow. So I'll say, you know, now this is just like basic stuff for me. We have, we've been having these women to women discussions as well, talking about some of those issues. And if they weren't saving before, so this is a basic life thing, that they should now start putting themselves in a situation to make sure that they're saving again. Now, my husband started out as a teacher. So as you know, teachers were 10 months, right? So they had to spread that salary over 12 months for years. And now it's different because he's an administrator now. But I always tell him first, you got to think about what are the practical things you need to do to make sure you don't find yourself in a situation like this again, one, right? But then number two, it is how else can you be entrepreneurial with, with the skills that you have? So with all of these people now having to be online, there are online companies and digital companies and companies that are providing uh, remote services that have a shortage of talent. And what point of view do you have that could really help them out? So look for those type of consultant opportunities and things of that nature. And again, I would say use your network. There, you might think it's corny, people have heard this, your network is your net worth. And have you been really thinking about your network to figure out who within that might have an opportunity for you, even if it's short term, to make a difference and think about things. I have a former EA who I knew was in New York, and he told me a few months ago that he was going to become a bartender and an actor. And so a few months ago, that was great. So I had a call with him a couple of days ago because I said I'm worried about him. He's probably not doing much right now. And he said he wasn't. But I know his skill set. And I know that I'm going to have a part-time position for a very short-term project coming up in the next few months. And I know that he could do that job remotely and he can really be good at it and he can finish that project for me, right? So each of those people probably have someone who they know in their network that might have a similar small opportunity that can actually close the gap at least for that two months. And then maybe into the next three or four months if a campus decides it's not coming back in the fall. Great, I think that's a, a great suggestion. I always tell the young candidates the, 
the worst they can do if they reach out and ask is they don't get a response. People want to be helpful, especially in this field. And can I say that too? If people, now, as you said, I'm busy, but we're all busy. So I really try, I work really hard not to say I'm very busy because I know there's probably somebody out there busier. But uh, when people reach out to you during this time, right, even as you're figuring out who to respond to, I know you, people respond to people who always contact, well, contact them every now who have stayed in touch. And, you know, as I prioritize who I respond to, it's always going to be the person who I'm more recently talked to. Because if you haven't talked to me in a very, very long time, and I get this email out the blue, right, I know, and you're telling me that you've lost your job, I'm empathetic. But I'm also like, okay, so now you know who I am, right? It's human nature. And if I'm getting tons of calls from people, the people who I'm going to respond to are the people who I've most recently heard from, who've kept in touch, I know what they're doing. So for both ends, I will say for those of you who are getting the calls, do respond if you can and find the time to do that, even if it's like midnight or one o'clock in the morning when you're up doing other things. And for people who find themselves in need now, I will say adopt the habit of staying and keeping in touch so that you're in touch when, uh, even when you don't need anything and people will remember that. Great, thank you. Um, two questions that we received I'm gonna pair together. So one attendee asked for advice on how to prepare for the possibility of being laid off. And then another attendee, I would say kind of a follow-up is, should they be laid off or if they've already been laid off, how do they talk about unemployment in a way that isn't so stigmatized? Okay, so I always, I wake up in the morning, I say thank you that uh, I woke up and thank you that I have a job, right? But I'm also it's always in the back of my head prepared that for not having a job. And I was literally just joking with someone, is terrible. we were talking about, I keep a box under my desk that has, that I can quickly put all my personals in and then you can ship me up, <laughs> ship everything to me, right? You just, and, and it's not, and I'm happy and, and I know that I'm appreciated. I just had my, my um, quarterly evaluation yesterday, right? So I know I'm good. But I think we should always be thinking about marketing ourselves and thinking about preparing for if something like this or something else happens and you won't have a job. And so please, every time you do something amazing and someone tells you you've done something amazing and it made a difference, please write that down and make sure you've added it to your resume, right? All those things, because when people read resumes now, they're not reading just for what you've done, they're reading for how you've changed that job or done something within that job that they can see you doing within their organization. So your resume should be a living document. And it should be something you're already working on and don't wait till now to do it. So that's how you prepare for that. The other thing is your network. It is just so important that you start now recultivating your network if you've been out of the loop. And you know, it's the time to reach out to the, you know, like those people I said who just reach out out of the blue and you're gonna do it, you, and, but it's the time to start doing it. And even, you know, say, look, I've been so busy. I know what, I've not been laid off. It's even better to do it before you've been laid off. But as I'm anticipating my options and my opportunities, I want to reach out and let you know that I could be in the market and I may be looking for something. Please think of me. Here's my updated information. So being proactive and again, talking to people, look, there's no stigma right now. Everybody knows what's going on. It's one thing where the economy is going great and you're getting fired. And we're like, OK, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Right, especially when there was a shortage of talent, right, three, just three months ago, right? It's a totally another thing where we know that there's a huge unanticipated change that happened and so many people find themselves in that same boat. So please don't be ashamed of that. You've got to get over that and you've got to talk to people about what's going on with you. You never know who can help. You know, just talking to, to your parents or talking to your siblings or talking to a friend you, or your husband talking on behalf to someone else about, hey, this is going on with my wife. You never know who knows of an opportunity. So don't shy away from sharing that you find yourself or could possibly find yourself in this situation. Great. Thank you. Um, Holly posed a good question on the question and answer. She asked, what, where do you see the biggest missteps for people managers during times like these. And if we asked for the top three things we shouldn't do, what would they be? Okay, wait a minute. So let me get my pen and paper, right? So top three things should not do. 
All right. And then the first thing is what, tell me again, the people manager question. Again. Where do you see the biggest missteps for people managers during times like these? So I'm really sensitive to this now because I'm an executive that represents 300,000 HR professionals. And this is what they tell us is they are relying on HR to do their job. It, and so they're not managing. And you've got to manage, even if you, you're not going to get it right all the time. Trust me. I don't, it, it's the one area I, I told you, I just had my review yesterday. I was so happy because it was the area for improvement for me in the last quarter. It is something we all struggle with managing people, but you've got to try to do it. So that's the number one thing is you've got to manage. You can't keep relying on HR to solve the problem for you. And the biggest thing is when it's not saying that you don't know how to do it. You know, one day you're an independent contributor, the next day you're managing people. It's, it, it happens overnight for most people. Have you done the things professionally? Have you talked to people? Have you found mentors and other people who found themselves in that situation and figured out how to manage people, right? Just because you got the promotion, your boss is managing people. So they don't have the time to all the time manage you to teach you how to manage people. Are you someone smart and curious enough to go out and figure out how to manage people? What are the, the, the things, you know, calling your friends who are already managers and saying, what are the things that you've found? How can I be a better person, a better manager for my people? And then I'll say the, the, the three biggest mistakes, again, not knowing that you don't know what you're doing, right? So not going and getting help so that you can be a manager. Not being transparent, right? Because people will create things in their head about what's going on and it will cause problems. So you're not communicating and being transparent with your people. I'm not saying telling them everything, though, you know, because there's sometimes you got to protect people from themselves, but you got to know when to be transparent with them and let them know what's coming and let them know when they're not doing their jobs. There's nothing worse than having someone who comes to HR trying to fire someone. And then you look at the performance reviews and there is nothing in the performance review that indicates that that person was not doing well at their job because you didn't communicate with them that they were not doing their job well. And it makes it difficult to terminate people. And then I think the, the next thing is not figuring out how to be an open collaborator with other people across the organization. Because when you know the business of other people or, across the organization, you can more easily repurpose your people or find growth opportunities for your people when there's only some so far they can go within your organization. And so if you don't know where the other openings are and the other opportunities are, you can't really manage your people into their next great thing. You can't go plant that seed of someone else in that new position and maybe later they can come back and work for you. So I think those are the three top things. That's great. And I think that leads into one of the other questions we received where somebody mentioned um, the opportunity to repurpose always sounds really great, except if budgets are simultaneously being cut, are there suggestions on how to repurpose while still cutting those budgets? Yeah. So look, I did a whole thing. I talked about culture. People don't believe me. And that's how we suffer, right? You sometimes have to figure, you're going to make a decision between two people take the actual position out of the equation. If you've got the right people who meet the cultural needs of your organization, right? Then you're gonna figure out how to keep that person. And that means repurposing them somewhere else. So if you focus on the people first and whether they fit into the culture of that organization, you have the right person, then you've gotta make a cut. You're cutting that position, but is this somebody who you can quickly reskill or repurpose? And that's the other piece. I think we overlook reskilling. We think reskilling means you got to go get a whole other associate's degree or certificate. And sometimes that is the case, right? But reskilling could be getting them a mentor, getting them a coach, something that's much cheaper, right? Who can coach them into how to use their current skills and leverage them in a new position, right? So again, think about that particular talent, that person has that particular piece, that particular talent, that piece that works well within the organization. And then if there's someone who doesn't, that's the person that goes, right? And then there's the, you're allowing yourself to repurpose. So you're, you're still making the cut, but you're cutting away at the piece that doesn't fit well into your culture. Because in the long term, this is going to be a bumpy ride for all of us. I want to take that ride with people who I know 
can, they don't have to be exactly like me, but they think like me, they understand, they understand the mission and they understand that we're trying to perform and how we wanna perform in this organization. Great, thank you, Emily. As you know, many of our housing professionals, uh, their jobs come with campus housing as part of their position. How would you, both as a manager, kind of prepare staff for the possibility of not only losing uh, their job, but potentially then the housing that comes with that for them and potentially partners or families, as well as how do you then prepare those of us that are currently living in campus, on-campus positions? I don't know if you all are gonna like my answer. So I'm, I'm pretty blunt, right? And I've been saying to our people that your employer is not here to solve your life problems. Um, you know, everyone keeps saying they don't want us to be in a paternalistic society, right? They don't want big brother watching or the government telling us what to do. What the employer is here to do is to make things easier and provide some resources. But there is a limit to that. We'll have to make our own decisions personally about what works for us and where we have connections, right? We are understanding as part of that position, you've always had that housing. That has changed and you're not the only person that's changing for. And in addition to dealing with your issue, we're dealing with the issues of the students, our customers. So we're trying to meet all of your needs. So here's, we can meet these needs by, the, we can meet some of your needs, but we can't address all your problems. And as our GC says all the time, we gotta all be grown, we gotta be adults, right? And so that we just can't continue to rely on the business, on the organization to solve our problems. We gotta put on our big boy, big girl panties and we gotta figure out how we are gonna make this work for our lives. And I think that's so important. You cannot rely on your employer to take care of you. Right, your agreement is the paycheck and the housing, and they can and they you know at any time that can stop because of something exigent like this. Then you got to have your plan A and your plan B. And so I think for all of us on this call, even those that don't find ourselves in this situation right now, please continue to have your plan A and your plan B. I joke a lot about the fact that we're in North Carolina at our house that we pay a mortgage on right now, teleworking. We have an apartment in Arlington. And my, my boss always says, oh, you all should just move up here permanently. Uh-uh, because the day you tell me that you no longer need my services, I have some place that has my name on the mortgage that I can pack my little bags and go to. You always gotta have a plan. And I just want more people to think like that. We can't depend on an entity to take care of all of our needs. Some of them, yes, but not all of them. Thank you, Emily. I can tell you, I know you haven't had a chance to go through the chat, but people have been very appreciative of the bluntness. Oh. So when you, you started that answer, I think it's, you know, that's why we have such a, a great uh, group of participants today, because this is exactly the information they need to hear um, from you. So, so thank you for your honesty and, and being blunt. Um, we've had a couple of questions around both how do we, right, thinking about articulating our value. You talked about talent. So how do managers articulate the value of kind of entire housing and residence life staff, particularly if campuses remain closed in the fall, um, to, you know, senior leaders, presidents, and so forth? Um, and then likewise, how do you suggest as people are looking outside the field, potentially, how do they articulate their value of the transferable skills that they bring with them from housing positions? So when I think about uh, the housing administrators that I've known, these are people who have to figure out how to make money to some extent, how to keep a customer happy, uh, and how to keep people engaged, right? Because the whole idea is you want people to buy into this experience of being on campus, of this holistic experience. So you can sell a whole experience. These are salespersons to some extent. So I've just told you right now that there's a sales skill involved in this work, that there's a fiscal skill involved in this work because you're budgeting and you're not just taking care of the people in those buildings. Sometimes you're taking care of the, build, the issues in the buildings, the, the, the facilities themselves. Um, I've told you that there's a customer service aspect to this work because people's parents, you know, I, I, I see the dorms and that have been built that are better than some people's houses, right? And so, and that was to meet a need where people felt they were they needed, if they were gonna go away to live on a campus and it had to be really nice. You know how to sell a product, right? You know how to compete 
in concert with your friends and admissions for talent and for customers. So think about those skills and find jobs where those are keywords. I think that's what you've got to think about. What else, what do you do every day, right? And then across the organization, right, we've got school stores. If for those that where housing is under auxiliaries, right? How are you marketing what the school has to offer to alumni at this point, right? Because there's still some alumni that have disposable income or want to buy something and want to do something other than just getting that call from the development office and saying, we need you to cut a check, right? What else can you do to get people excited about supporting the university through the auxiliary offering? So we're talking about either even using the facilities because sometimes you manage the rental, external rentals of those facilities, even though now more, some states are opening up so you can do 50 people, how are you getting them to say, hey, instead of using this, this other hotel, we've got space on your local state campus to use that space for this event, right? How are you getting them to go buy online from the school store? And how are you marketing those things? So I think you can market. I didn't think about marketing is another skill you have. So I think you, what you need to do is really, it's a great exercise to do with your team because it will help everyone. What are the skills that we have that are adaptable to other parts of the university campus? You know, and, and do a big, you know, have to have the sheet up and take pictures of it and send it to the president or VP and say, this is how our people can be of service to you right now during this time. This is why we're essential. Right. And you can send all these other people home. We can do you can get a two for for us. Right. Because we know we can do this. We'll be ready to go back in when the students come back. But in the interim, we can offer these skills to you. Emma, that's great. And I think that's giving everybody a little extra motivation um, to, to get through this. So that's wonderful. And I, I can envision um, some great conversations on the online community where we can all be helping each other brainstorm more of those values that we bring to the table. So we only have a little bit of time left. So I wanna wrap it up with a couple questions and some parting thoughts with you before some closing housekeeping items. So switching gears a little bit, as we have uh, learned how to work remotely and um, even in housing positions, we have had some housing staff that now have not only been forced to work remotely, but have done so incredibly successfully and would actually like to continue to work remotely. Do you have suggestions on how to negotiate this moving forward? Okay. So once again, <laughs> And um, we're having these conversations too. Our offices are reopening on June 1st. So literally I've been having these conversations with our teams and things of that nature. So look, I'll say this. We want, you, you see the articles, you hear Twitter saying everybody can work from home. You hear Silicon Valley, the rest of them saying, oh, you're going to be home till September or October. That's nice. That's their business. Your business is different. And when we talk about work, worker, and workplace at Sherman, we always talk about trying to make things work for the employer and the employee. So we're each going to have to meet each other uh, in the middle if we can, close to the middle as we can. And I think employees are asking for a lot right now where the market is not your market anymore. So three months ago, you probably could have said, this is what I want to do next because we were trying to recruit people and we had all these vacancies. Today, it is an employer's market. And you need to have a little bit of common sense about how you approach these things. If your boss tells you that uh, they want you to come in the office, you come in the office. If that doesn't work for you, then simultaneously, you conduct a job search to find a job where you can work 100% remotely. What people forget is we spend a lot of time making sure our employees are happy and comfortable. But employees don't spend enough time making sure that their bosses are getting what they need because ultimately your boss has to report to someone else. And if, what your, bo if your boss is not getting what they need from you or in or the situation, then your division is not successful. And when they're around that executive table at the end of the year trying to get their piece of the pie for the budget, things will look really different. So I need employees to understand that that decision is not completely up to them just because they feel comfortable doing something and it works for them, it has to work for their boss. I'll give you an example of my government affairs team. You know, they've been extremely productive from home, but I've always said, 
government affairs people should not work remotely because we spend most of our time out of the office. We're in meetings, we're on the Hill, we're doing this. So when you're not in those meetings, you need to be in the office developing the internal relationships from the people in research and membership who help you get the information that you share when you're on the Hill. You can't do that being a remote employee in my shop. And as I'm the boss, it's gotta work for me too. And so you got to have that blunt conversation with people and encourage people that if it doesn't work for them, here's a great opportunity for you to still don't quit on the job, to do a good job, but simultaneously be looking for something that does work for you. And I'll tell you one thing we're telling employers to do, you know, more employers, we used to tell them, put, stop putting a degree requirement in a job description because every job doesn't need a BA. But we're telling you now, add in your job description if this job can be done remotely because then people will apply for things that they know can be done remotely and it makes that process easier. Well, Emily, thank you. We have more questions, but I know we cannot get to all of them today, but that just goes to show how important and timely this topic was. Um, I am going to wrap it up with a few housekeeping items, but do you have any last words that you would want to share with today's attendees? I think I shared with you all that uh, right before this call, we had a virtual baby shower for one of my EAs. And it was such a lovely event. It was so nice to see her excited and surprised. And so I would just say to you, think about those positive moments and all the good things that have come out of us being at home with our families and all the other positive silver linings, because there are some silver linings during this time. But also think of this time as an opportunity to think about next. Next normal doesn't just have to be next normal for employers. It's the next normal for you. How do you want your career to look next and to use this opportunity to, to plan it out and, and to get started on it? Great. Thank you, Emily. That's a, a great way to wrap up. And, and speaking of next, that leads us into next week's virtual roundtables. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. You will be able to find a recording of this. We will post this on the resource page. I know a couple of people asked that in the past um, in, the, in the question and answer. In addition, we have upcoming virtual roundtables for next week. Uh, next week's programs are sponsored by Quadiant. And on Tuesday, we have I'm Fine, a space for professionals of color. Wednesday's roundtable will focus on preparing for fall, rethinking campus mail service centers, Thursday, we'll uh, focus on senior housing officers. And Friday is Lean on Me, How Women Support Women in the Housing Profession. Um, in addition, don't forget to continue to check out our Akuhawai online resources. As I mentioned, we are recording our roundtables, so you can find our YouTube channel with the roundtables that have previously happened. Uh, this one will be joining that. Again, we encourage you to use the Aku Hawaii online community. As Emily talked about uh, brainstorming and thinking of ways to continue to articulate our value of, uh, to other administrators, I think this is a great conversation, for example, that can be posted and continue to be chatted through on the online community. And then during all of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we are continuing to update and pose resources on the COVID-19 resources page for everyone to be able um, to see. So with that, um, it is uh, just about the top of the hour. And so I want to thank everybody for joining us today and a special thanks to Emily Dickens for this incredibly important information that was shared with us. So thank you everybody very much and enjoy the rest of your day.